December the 1st, 1955, around 6 p.m., a 42-year-old black woman by the name of Rosa Parks was on her way home from a long day's work as a seamstress at the Fair Department Store in Montgomery, Alabama. She boarded the Cleveland Avenue bus and took her seat on the front row of the black section. The bus soon filled up and the driver asked Rosa and three other black passengers to give up their seat and move further back so white passengers could sit down. Three quickly moved without incident. Rosa refused. She will peaceably be taken off the bus and arrested. She spent two hours in jail before being released. This was the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott. Some say that it was the real beginning of the civil rights movement. In 1996, Rosa Louise McCauley Parks was presented with the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Bill Clinton. What seemed to be a spontaneous act that resulted in the 1956 Supreme Court decision banning segregation on public transportation was everything but spontaneous. In 1943, 12 years before the famous bus ride, Rosa Parks was elected secretary of the NAACP Montgomery branch. Her husband Raymond Parks, whom she married at age 19, had been involved with the Montgomery branch for years. Raymond was active in the NAACP, raising money for the defense of the Scottsboro Boys. The Scottsboro Boys was nine teenage blacks accused of raping two white women. One of the women recanted her story years later and said they had made the story up of rape. It never occurred. To Rosa's dismay, the NAACP was making little progress moving civil rights forward. She decided to put her faith in the future of the civil rights movement in the hands of the black youth. She created the NAACP Youth Council and served as its advisor. They needed to find a project that people would support and decided on the Montgomery City Bus Line. The Youth Council was established in 1954 and Parks became advisor and mentor to several young members. One such member was 15-year-old Claudette Colvin. On March 2, 1955, nine months before the historic bus ride of Rosa Parks, Claudette Colvin left Booker T. Washington High School, caught the Capitol Heights bus on her way home. When a white woman was left standing in the front, bus driver Robert E. Clear asked Colvin, and three other blacks in her row to move to the back. The other three moved. Claudette remained seated. In the meantime, Ruth Hamilton, a pregnant lady, got on the bus and sat in the seat next to Claudette. Colvin stated later that the bus driver asked both of them to move. She said Mrs. Hamilton said that she was tired and didn't feel like standing. A man sitting behind them agreed to give her his seat. Claudette still refused to move and was arrested by two Montgomery policemen. She refused to cooperate and was forcibly removed from the bus screaming. She spent three hours in jail before being bailed out. She said her mother told her to be quiet about what she had done. Let Rosa be the one, she said. The first night her father sat up all night with a shotgun. The entire community acted as lookout, afraid the Ku Klux Klan would show up. The NAACP hoped that the arrest of Claudette would be used to unite the black community. However, they didn't like the rebellious attitude of the teenager. On April 29th, less than two months after the arrest of Claudette Coven, and eight months before Rosa Parks, 37-year-old Arella Broder entered a Montgomery City bus and took her seat, this time in the white section. She had been a civil rights worker for the NAACP for some time. 
Although Arilla was well-educated and strong-willed, the public still refused to take part. On October 21st, almost six months after the arrest of Broder, and less than two months before Rosa Parks, 18-year-old Mary Louise Smith was on her way home on a city bus when she refused to give up her seat. She was arrested and fined $12. E.D. Nixon, president of the Montgomery chapter of the NAACP, decided not to use Mary because her dad drank. The family denied the allegations. Nixon said she was the wrong class and would not stand up under public scrutiny. He was wrong. Smith's dad will later represent her in court without the aid from outside political organizations. On the same day that Mary Louise Smith was arrested, 21st of October, 1955, Susie McDonnell, or Miss Sue as she was affectionately called, was arrested for not giving up her seat on the Montgomery bus. Miss Sue was in her 70s and walked with a cane. She was light-skinned, blue-eyed, with straight hair. When she sat in the white section, no one said anything. I looked white, she said. Miss Sue made sure everyone knew she was black. She was arrested and quietly taken off the bus. In 1954, a young preacher became pastor of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery. It was 26-year-old Dr. Martin Luther King. He had been selected to lead the newly established Montgomery Improvement Association, which supported the NAACP and will later guide the boycott. The young civil rights leader realized that people needed someone that they knew and would follow. King wrote Rosa Parks a letter. He told her she was the one. The black community knew her and trusted her from her years with the NAACP. Her reputation was untouchable, and the community was familiar with her family. Her young brother Sylvester James McCauley, along with Rosa and their mother, had moved in with Rosa's grandmother in Montgomery when her dad left the family. Only a few days before her famous bus ride, Rosa was attending a mass meeting helping on the Emmett Hill case. 42-year-old Rosa Parts was employed at the Fair Department Store as a seamstress while also working with the NAACP. It's believed that she may have tried several times before she was arrested. People would simply go on by and ignore her. However, at 6 p.m. on Thursday, the 1st of December, 1955, Rosa boarded the Cleveland Avenue bus number 2857 on her way home from a long day at work. She recognized the bus driver, James Blake. Back in 1943, Blake had ejected Parks from his bus. After she refused to re-enter the bus through the back door after paying her fare, at the front. She said, I never wanted to ride that man's bus again. The bus drivers had been given police powers to eject anyone from their buses. This day, Rosa was asked to move further back so white passengers could sit down. Three others got up and moved. When Rosa refused, he called the police. Rosa asked in a polite, quiet voice, the policeman, why are you doing this? He said, I don't know. It's just the law. Parks acted in a dignified manner, even when being booked, fingerprinted, and incarcerated for a short time. Her family was terrified for her. She refused to show any fear. Although the fear was real, the movement had decided to use all women in their attempts to integrate the Montgomery bus system. It was dangerous for women, but life-threatening for men. Emmett Till, James Earl Cheney, Michael Swarner, Andrew Goodman, James Lee Jackson, George Washington Lee, Medgar Evers, 
Martin Luther King and others, not to speak of others that were beaten up and left to die, or James Meredith who was shot. When word spread that Rosa Parks had been arrested, E.D. Nixon, president of the local NAACP, quickly called attorney Fred Gray to see to Rosa's release. Handbills were quickly printed up and spread throughout the black community, requesting that the black patrons not ride the city bus for one day, Monday the 5th, as a protest. Reverend King said his wife, Coretta, looked out their window where she could see the city bus going by, and it was empty. He said he knew then the boycott would work. The boycott lasted from December the 5th, 1955 until December the 20th, 1956, some 381 days. Attorney Fred Gray filed suit against the city of Montgomery to desegregate the city bus lines. Browder v. Gale was filed in federal court. The main plaintiffs, Arilla Browder, Claudette Colvin, Susie McDonald, and Mary Louise Smith. Janetta Reese had originally been a complainant, but withdrew because of threats. W. A. Gale, mayor of Montgomery, was the defendant. Shortly after Rosa's arrest, she was fired from her job at the Ferris Department Store. Soon her husband left his job after he was told he couldn't speak of his wife or her legal problems on the job. It became almost impossible for her to find work, although she continued to travel and speak on the behalf of the Civil Rights Movement. On June 30, 1956, U.S. District Court ruled the laws unconstitutional. On December 20, 1956, the U.S. Supreme Court ordered Alabama to desegregate their public transportation. But all was not smooth. Rosa had a disagreement with Reverend King and other civil rights leaders because she supported the militant black power movement whose leaders disagreed with the nonviolent movement of Dr. King's. We must get in our hearts that it is possible to be courageous and yet nonviolent. From the disagreement, she and her husband left Montgomery in 1957 and moved to Hampton, Virginia. She got a job with the Hampton Institute. In a few months, they moved to Detroit to be close to Rosa's brother, Sylvester. She worked as a seamstress until 1965, when she became an administrative aide to the Detroit office of Congressman John Conyer, Jr. From 1977 until 1979, Rosa will lose her husband, brother and mother, all to cancer. In 1988, after 23 years with Representative Conyers, Rosa retired early from failing health. In August of 1994, 81-year-old Rosa Parks was attacked and robbed of $53 by a drug addict named Joseph N. Skipper. She was upstairs in her home when she heard a noise downstairs. When she went down to investigate, a man was inside her home. Her back door had been kicked off the hinges. Skipper told her that someone else did that, and he was there to protect her. Then all of a sudden he struck her in the face and ran. She was taken to the Detroit Receiving Hospital, where she was treated for swelling on the right side of her face and chest bruises. Skipper was sentenced to eight years in prison. He stated later, that he didn't know whose home it was. On October 24, 2005, at the age of 92, Rosa Louise McCauley Parks passed away from natural causes, leaving behind a legacy of restoring civil rights to our country. Rosa was placed in the rotunda of the United States Capitol for two days, so America could show their respect to this courageous lady.